Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. Today on Central Booking, Amazon Charts best-selling author Jess Lowry. Jess is the author of Bloodline, which won this year's prestigious International Thriller Writers Award for Best Paperback Original. The story was inspired by a real-life missing persons case and introduces intrepid reporter Joan Harkin. The victim of a violent mugging, Joan agrees to move from a big city to her fiancé's small hometown of Lilydale, Minnesota, where they plan to raise their unborn child together. But the town's outward charms soon reveal a claustrophobic and creepy underbelly, and a sinister secret that threatens to destroy everything Joan holds dear. Jess is a retired professor of creative writing and sociology and a recipient of the Lofts Excellence in Teaching Fellowship. She's also a blogger at Psychology Today, a TEDx presenter, and leads women's writing retreats. She has written for children and adults, and her books encompass crime novels, nonfiction, YA adventure, and magical realism. Her most recent releases are Unspeakable Things and Latani. Jess's book on craft, Rewrite Your Life, is a step-by-step -step guide on how to draw from real-life experiences and emotions to inform fictional stories. Bloodline was inspired by the author's own fascination with secrets, not to mention her instincts as a mother and a writer. Publishers Weekly called the book a chilling mystery and noted Lowry ratchets up the suspense. Fans of Rosemary's Baby will relish this. Now, Jess Lowry reveals the facts behind her fiction and offers us generous advice and heartfelt affirmation as we endeavor to discover the underlying truths of our own stories. Hi, everybody. Today, I am in conversation with Amazon Charts bestselling author Jess Lowry, whose novel Bloodline just recently won the International Thriller Writers Award for Best Paperback Original Novel. Welcome to the show, Jess, and congratulations. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm thrilled to have you here. And so before we really get into it, I just, I have to ask you, you know, I want to take you back to that moment. You're actually sitting there, you know, in person and you hear that your book has won. Can you tell us, you know, what that moment meant for you and the validation, you know, from your peers? That must have been sort of mind blowing and to actually experience it in person, even though we're sort of going through this crazy pandemic. Yeah. And I can't, I still haven't processed it. It was the first award I've one in person. And first of all, have you been to Thriller Fest before? Yes. Couple oh times. my gosh. It's like being in a hotel with movie stars, right? It is the luminaries of the crime fiction field. And so I'm just walking down a hall and I felt like I was a four-legged creature pretending to be human because there's all these like grown-ups in suits and nice. And so I just sort of slunk along for a few days. Um, feeling completely out of my league, out of my element. Everybody was nice. This was this was just me. Everybody was nice. And so I'm sitting there that night, and, and obviously I know I'm nominated, and I'm sitting at the table with another nominee who's, uh, we're, we're up to the same award. We have the same publisher. His book's fantastic. And then I heard my name, and I just sat there. I just sat there like a weird Midwestern lump who was sure it was some big... I don't know, like I was sleeping and I was going to like get up and start walking toward the stage and somebody was going to get the hook and be like, nobody said your name, Jess Lowry. And so my publisher turns around and she's like, congratulations. And I said, what is happening? And she said, you need to go, <laughs> you need to go up there. And I'm like, okay. And I walked up there and I, I, I've been teaching for 22 years, but I do not like public speaking like most writers, right? Oh, but I am standing up on that stage and I look out at all these faces I admire and I just started having a really good time. I have no idea what I said, um, but whatever I said, like it, it was words because people nodded and then I got off stage and then I had this beautiful award and I, I still haven't processed it. As you said, there's something about uh, getting approval from your peers that is just priceless, right? It's just so validating. Yeah, I would imagine. And it is such an outstanding book. So, Thank you know, you. yeah, kudos to you. It was so much fun to read. You know, people really do have to pick it up. Um, and the nice thing is there's you've got quite an impressive backlist for people to catch up on, even though you're very <laughs> prolific. You know, it's funny. It takes so long to, to write these books and we read them so quickly and then we're like, OK, what's next? But in your case, you know, there's a good, I don't know, 18, 19 <laughs> books that people can explore while they're waiting for the next one. Yeah. Um, 
But anyway, so I was telling you before we started recording that I actually, um, I also read Rewrite Your Life, which is sort of a book on craft. And so I'm gonna try to formulate this conversation, um, you know, using one book to sort of refer to the other so people can get an idea of how Rewrite Your Life plays into a story uh, like Bloodline. We'll see how successful I am at that. <laughs> or not. Um, but before we do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot. I don't know. Some people are really good at elevator pitches and some people are not. But just to orient, you know, viewers who may not be familiar with Bloodline, would you mind just telling us, you know, what the elevator pitch for that book, or I guess you can say uh, the novel concept, which is a term from your other book. But can you just give us a brief introduction into that story before we break it down more specifically? Sure. Um I am terrible at elevator pitches, but I'm really good at pretending. So here goes. So Bloodline is set in 1968, and it features a female newspaper reporter at a time when female journalists were relegated to the wedding section of the newspaper. She moves to a small town uh, with her fiance. It's his hometown. And she starts to feel like the whole town is out to get her. And hopefully the reader doesn't know if it's in her head or really happening until the very end. Sure, that was very good. Thanks. And you know what? I always feel bad too asking people to do their own elevator pitch because I could do it, but I'm sure I would botch it. And you'd be like, that's not my book. Did you read my book? <laughs> but you know what people don't realize sometimes is, you know, the book came out so long ago that you've probably written one or two more since and then you have to try to go back and, and remember it. Um, but anyway, I'm going to tell you with your two books, I had a really interesting reading experience. I don't think I've ever done this before, but I actually decided to make Bloodline, my nighttime reading, and then my daytime reading was Rewrite Your Life. So I was sort of reading them concurrently. And it was interesting because I've never quite done that before. And I think that it, you know, sort of gave me a different appreciation for your fiction doing it that way. Um, and for people who don't know, Rewrite Your Life is basically about, you know, taking um, experiences or emotions that are true to you and formatting them uh, in a fictional sense. So it's not necessarily a literal truth, it's an essential truth. And I think that, you know, very common advice is write what you know. Uh, and sometimes maybe people take that too literally. It's sort of take what you know and twist it. So applying that to Bloodline, I'm just, I'm wondering if you can tell us a few things that play into that story. What of you informs the character of Joan Harkin? Um, I'm assuming, you know, wife, and motherly instincts play into that. And then second part of the question would be, it's also based loosely on a true case. So if you can tell us a bit about those two things that you weave into a sort of a fictional canvas. Yeah, first of all, I wrote down, it's an essential truth, not a literal truth. That is the best uh, pitch for Rewrite Your Life I've ever heard. So thank oh, you for that. Yeah, I'm, ste I'm stealing that. And I'm not going to give you credit. <laughs> <laughs> so I do... And I think a lot of writers do pull from our real life to tell our stories, uh, even if, especially if they're fiction, because as you said, it's these sort of archetypal experiences and emotions of shame, of stage fright, of love, of surprise that we all experience that we're injecting into our fiction. So Rewrite Your Life is, uh, breaks it down step by step how to do that. And when it came to Bloodline, I pulled on, I mean, there's a lot of things that really happened to me or people I know sewn into the book, but the biggest overarching thing uh, was this, I hope human struggle, I hope I'm not the only weirdo with it, but this human, <laughs> this human struggle to feel like you don't belong, mm -hmm. especially in a small town, especially when you're not from there um, and you show up and it seems like everybody knows the rules, everybody else knows how to dress, how to walk, how to say the funny thing, and you're just sort of uh, feeling always marginalized. And so it was that emotion that I, that I drew on in Bloodline. And like you said, it's also inspired by a true story. Um, I grew up in Painesville, Minnesota, population 2000 something in the 80s. And there were two very famous crimes that happened, one in 1945, um, which Bloodline is inspired by, and the other one that happened in 1989, uh, which Unspeakable Things, another of my books, is inspired by. But the 1945 case is the case of a, a missing boy, and he was um, in half-day kindergarten in Painesville, 1945, September. His teacher had a note not to let him leave, uh, but she let him leave, and he walked out of the school that morning, was never seen again. And 
uh, the civilian Air Force came in and looked for him. Uh, volunteers from all over the state came in, newspapers from all over the state came in, and he just was never found. Um, and he might still be alive because he was never found, we don't know. And so that that is sort of the engine behind Bloodline. And then it's uh, that whole feeling like a stranger in a strange land. Sure, sure. And it must be interesting too. I know this isn't the first book that you've you know drawn on a real life case for. Is it difficult for you to balance you know entertainment value with sensitivity and knowing that this is very real to people? Yeah. Yes. I I don't think I could write actual true crime because with without the the victims. Um, permission and involvement, because I would never want to take somebody's story like that when most victims have already had too much taken from them. But when it's true crime inspired uh, fiction, and specifically with unspeakable things in Bloodline, I write from the perspective of somebody in the community or outside the community, but looking at it as an outsider. And so their perspective of what it is to see trauma unfold. So rather than telling the perspective of the, of the actual victims, it's how are we affected as a community, as a neighborhood, personally, when we when we have these horrific events happen around us? Sure, absolutely. And so let me ask you a bit more about your protagonist, uh, Joan Harkin. So she has a very, you know, transformative experience throughout the book, I suppose, as main yeah. characters um, should <laughs> have. So can you tell us in non-spoilery terms, a yeah. bit about what her progression is and how that does exemplify the journey of a main character. Yeah, yes. And so she, um, in 1968, is is she wants to be she wants to be a straight up journalist, not not uh, relegated to the women's section. She wants to take on the important stories, of which there were many in 1968. Right? It's the Vietnam War. It's the assassination of. Robert Kennedy, uh, it's the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. There's some big things happening in the country and she wants to take it on, um, but then she gets mugged and she discovers she's pregnant and her fiance uses that as a as sort of a springboard to say, you know what, let's, let's move to my hometown. There's a newspaper there, you'll have a job. You know, we can raise this baby free of the big city uh, crime. And so she moves somewhat reluctantly and then the world starts closing in on her. Like it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so her journey as a character is how to not only hang on to herself, but how to find herself in this new environment, in a culture that doesn't want her to have a voice, in a home that doesn't want to have her voice um, and in a time that doesn't want her to have a voice. Sure. So let me ask you a bit more about that because it's I love you know when setting is very atmospheric and sort of absorbing uh, and it becomes its own character. So can you tell me a bit how you see place is enhancing plot and specifically maybe you know that small town setting because I know that your roots are you know Midwestern and that's not something that's foreign to you at all. And I myself you know have grown up in small towns and lived in small towns and they can be you know both comforting and also very claustrophobic yeah yes it's exactly it i um i grew up in a small town and i i think there is no scarier place in the world because although the crime per capita is usually smaller it's also personal right because everybody knows each other and so if you are driving in minnesota in the winter and your car goes in the ditch, you will have a bunch of people out there to help you in a minute, right? That's the plus side of the small town. The downside is everybody in town will know within two minutes that you went in the ditch and, and you don't know who's coming to help you, right? You don't, it's not, it can be very personal. It can be very upsetting. So for me, I love writing about small towns because there is that push and pull of, of, of the comfort of it and also I don't know. That's when the ugly stuff happens, when we get too comfortable. Sure. And then a lot of times, too, I mean, I think that the anonymity of sort of bigger cities can also be terrifying. But, yeah. you know, small town, something happens and you realize that you, you know, you know these people or maybe you didn't know them at all and you thought that you did. And I always find that kind of, you know, the scariest sort of situational 
set up. And I wanted to expand on that a bit too, because in Rewrite Your Life, you talk a lot about setting and how it's not simply a place, but it's also time and mood. So yeah. I'm wondering if you can share a bit about, you know, those telling details. For instance, in Bloodline, I remember that, you know, some of the appliances were described as avocado green and I've yeah. seen that. And so it triggered a memory and it does bring you to a very specific place in time. So can you talk a bit about, you know, those telling details and how they help to establish an immersive atmosphere or give the reader sort of a sensory smorgasbord to draw on? Yeah, so what I do when I'm writing my period fiction, whether it's set in the 80s, the 70s, or the 60s, like Bloodline, I will immerse myself in horror movies from that decade. And because it's got great suspense, right? And also the horror movies are touching on whatever people were afraid of, whether it is assimilation, communism, whatever it is. And I will write down, I have always right next to my couch, I have a legal pad and I write down details. Like what did the car look like? What does the fridge look like? Um, you know, what sort of, I remember in the eighties, we used to, everybody had those macrame owls or those big spoon and fork sets. <laughs> and they're like, what were those? <laughs> so I just, I just watch the movies and I write everything down and then I will search for food. I will search for slang and I, I create sort of a, a, a master list of details, but then I only use about 10% of them because otherwise for me as a reader, it pulls me out of a story. If it feels like the writer's flexing, like, look at, I happen to know, you know, what the box of French onion soup looked like in 1974, you know, so you don't want too much of that. Uh, but I think enough of it so that, like you said, the reader feels immersed in the story. So instead of just reading it, they're sitting in it. And so I, I don't know how, how to find that perfect balance, but I do go, I do aim for it. Sure. Uh, I, that's terrific. I, I've never heard anybody say, you know, surprisingly, just watch a movie from that time period. You know, so many people say the research into that kind of thing can be really tedious and go on forever. But like, how much fun is it to sit down with a movie from the genre that you like? And it's funny you would mention horror because I love those movies myself. And just today um, or last night, they released the trailer for Halloween Ends, which is like the final confrontation between Michael Myers and Lawrence final. Road. Final. again, <laughs> right? Like, I'm like, what if we lived through this like 20 years ago? Yeah. But it's so funny because I watched the trailer and, you know, it's very evocative of 1978 because they have her in a similar outfit and her hair looks similar. And all of a sudden it transports you right back to Halloween night, 1978. But anyway, I digress. I do that a lot. But I think my point was how much fun is that to like yeah. pop in a movie and be like, I'm doing research, but I'm also enjoying a movie. So that's a terrific takeaway. And I've never heard anybody say that before yeah. in doing a hundred plus of these episodes. So okay. Yeah. I absolutely so advise it. Yeah. That's fun. That's a fun yeah. thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let me ask you, you know, one other thing I wanted to ask you about Bloodline specifically before we move into broader territory is just, we've talked a little bit about your character and the struggles, you know, that she's facing, you know, trying to be an independent and autonomous woman and not really having that situation set up for her. And even though this book is set in 1968, uh, you know, I find that it's unfortunately really still revelant and resonant today. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that, you know, trying to create a time and place for a book, but also having a sense of timelessness so that if we read it at another time, it might still speak to an audience, whether or not, you know, I mean, it's not, you can't necessarily predict what yeah. issues are going to be happening in the world, but there's some reflection going on between this book that was written a few years ago and current times, if you wouldn't mind speaking to that. Yeah. And it's, um, it's, terrifying and sad how much resonance there is between the the lack of rights for women in 1968 and what we're seeing these days and and unfortunately in my experience and in the experience of my friend my female friends um, and those who identify as female is just the amount of pushback you get just for just for claiming your space and so I I was working, obviously I don't have a crystal ball, but I was working from that idea of just every day as a woman, it's a battle. And, and of course it's even more if you're a trans woman or a woman of color to just feel safe, to just feel like you belong, to just feel like you have a seat at the table. And so that was the theme that I really actively wanted to work with. I still wanted it to be a page turner, right? I wanted it to be immersive, but but that, but that thread really resonated with me. Um, and so it was pretty easy to weave it throughout the story. 
Sure. And it is terrifying to read something like that because so often we tell ourselves, oh, we've come so far. And then you realize, <laughs> no, not really. And, you know, it's two steps forward, three steps back sometimes, which is just really, really frustrating. And then you read about 1968 and you're like, it's just, you know, same issues, new day and right. new generation, which is crazy. Um, all right. So we're going to move away from Bloodline a bit, but I did want to ask you if you wouldn't mind telling us you know, what drew you back to writing as an adult? And then also, if you wouldn't mind talking about how your reading preferences sort of led you into what your field of writing became and why it is that the mystery genre speaks to you specifically in the trajectory of that kind of story. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up, we were very poor, um, not dirt poor, but pretty poor, but we had a library. And so my dad had built it himself. It was just, it was garage sale, sci-fi mostly like with those great covers but it was just hundreds and hundreds of them and I had my Stephen King section and my sister had like her Piers Anthony section and my mother who was an English teacher had her literary section but we always had books so I, I was sort of immersed with that from from the word go uh, that's the plus side of my family the negative side is that a lot that we, it was creepy I had a creepy family <laughs> <laughs> it really did. And there was not a lot of room for for my sister and I's story. And so I grew up really wanting um, a passive audience, I guess, really wanting to tell a story that people had to listen to. And if you really want people to listen, I find there is not a better vehicle than crime fiction. Um, because it's got, I mean, it's got such great character development. It's got, if it's done well, a powerful setting but it's a vehicle for something more important, whether it's justice, whether it's social commentary, uh, it's a vehicle for something really important, but it's told in a page turning way. And so I was naturally drawn to crime fiction. Um, and I, when I first started writing it, I thought it would also be the easiest to write. And I look back and I'm like the hubris of me <laughs> right, at the time. Right? I mean, I'm still 23 years later learning so much about it, but it, but I did like the idea that it, it is uh, something that makes people listen and it's, and it's got like something really important baked into it. And so that's how I came to crime fiction. Sure. I forgot sure. the question. I just, what was I? What was oh, there was like three. You okay. Know? okay. That's on me. No, but I was just wondering too. Um, I mean, that's obviously the story of what brought you back to writing. And I'm just yeah. wondering, is there anything specific about the, you know, the trajectory of a crime novel where you said, all right, this is the genre I should be writing in because you know, I find my catharsis here for whatever reason. Or was it more you just, that's what you enjoyed reading, so you figure that's probably what you should be writing? Yeah, you know, I came back. I, I loved Trixie Belden and Nancy Drew Young, but I got a degree in English, and then I got a master's degree in English, and they really beat any uh, love of genre fiction out of you, or at least they try. And so I'd, <laughs> and so I'd worked away from that. And I was just, I was just reading straight lit fiction, literary fiction and teaching. So I was teaching lit courses, um, the classics, but then it was, and I've got a TEDx talk about this. It's, it's a sad story, but it's also my story, which was uh, in 2001, my husband committed suicide. And at the time I had not been writing for a year or two because I was teaching full time. I had a child, I was pregnant with my second um, and it just, writing was, seemed very um, luxurious. I didn't have, indulgent, I didn't have time mm. for it. But then when my husband committed suicide um, on 9-11, I ended up in the hospital. Uh, I was three months pregnant. I ended up in the hospital because I thought I was miscarrying. And I wasn't, my son's fine. He's, uh, he's, 20, he's 20 years old, he's wonderful. But my doctor at the time told me if I didn't find out how to get the stress out, it might, it might make it so that it might, yeah, it might hurt my baby. So I went to a therapist, saw him regularly, and I started um, writing again. And he told me to journal, which I cannot do. I have too much of that Protestant work ethic. It seems like I'm just going to write words to no end. And I think journaling is great. I do, but I just could never get my head around it. So I, so I started writing a mystery and it was Mayday, which is looking back so funny because it was a cry for help, um, but it was a humorous small town mystery. And I had no humor in my life at the time. I was living in a small town, um, but there was something really appealing about the structure, uh, how the main character could have answers, which I wasn't ever, I have never gotten. Um, and also how 
uh, her allies could hold her up because so many people were holding me up at the time. And um, I finished it and it, it got me through the worst of it, through the darkest of the dark. And I found that I really liked writing mysteries too. So I just, what, 21 books later stuck with it. Sure. Thank you for sharing that. I know that's a very yeah. personal story and I appreciate that. And it and it's interesting because it makes you sort of think differently about the mystery. I mean, I've read them since mm -hmm. I can remember, so 30 some odd years now. And I don't think I ever really thought much about it beyond the, oh, can I solve the puzzle, you know, before yeah. the character in the book does. I always sort of liked the thrill of that. Uh, and then I read, you know, that Carolyn Hart said, well, really, it's it's about justice. You know, you're not guaranteed justice in real life, but more times than not in a book, you know, at the end of the story, you know, things are going to work out in their own way. And I'm like, well, duh, maybe, you know, subconsciously, <laughs> that's what I've been seeking all along because we have so little control of what happens, you know, outside of our person. Um, but that sort of brings me back to rewrite your life, with, which I think is a terrific resource for Thank really you. any writer, beginning or not. Um, but I wanted to ask you about that because one of the things that you sort of confess in that is that nonfiction, memoir, it does not appeal to you at all. And yet by virtue of this book, you sort of had to write that way. It's incredibly, you know, personal to you, but that sort of shows the process and how it works. You can't really have that book without getting that very deep background on your life. And I'm wondering if you can talk about you know, what that process was like being that vulnerable on the page. And then did you find that that actually having gone through that strengthened your personal character? Yeah, that is such a good question. You know, it, it was not something I ever wanted to write. Part of growing up in a small town is you keep your secrets, right? You don't talk about, you don't talk about that stuff. However, the older I get, and I'm 52 now, the older I get, the more I find out that when we speak our secrets, which are also the things that are true to us, um, that's how we find our people. That's how we find our community. Um, and that's also how we find our way out of the past. And so uh, I sold the book on spec, which is not uncommon with nonfiction. It, it means that I had the concept in the first three chapters, but that's all that was written. And the first three chapters changed quite a bit from the pitch to the finished product. And I just had a good editor who just let me do it kind of a chapter at a time. And so I'd be like, okay, I wrote that and survived. I wrote that and survived. And I just sort of got my way through it. And a lot of it is teaching, which I'm very comfortable doing. So that was sort of a crutch I could lean on. And I know personally that a story is the best vehicle for learning. Like I can give you a bunch of facts and you will maybe remember them. Nothing against you. It's just how the, <laughs> the human brain is. Or I can tell you a story and you'll remember that story. And so as a teacher, I knew I needed to be honest. I knew I needed to work it in there. Um, and then it went out into the world and people have just been very kind about it. So it turned into a, a reinforcing. You were talking about my own personal um, I don't know what the word you use, my own personal evolution. Uh, it was very powerful for that, to put that out there and to get all of this positive feedback from people who are using uh, the method. It was really powerful. Sure, that's terrific. And isn't that usually how it goes? It's the thing that, you know, you're worried the most about that people relate to the most. And Exactly. You know, you can write 20 novels and 50 years from now, 30 years from now, this will be the book that people are, you know, still coming up to you to, to talk yeah. about. And of course, Bloodline, because it wasn't yeah. the genre. Um, <laughs> but let me ask you too. So, you know, all too well that writers tend to fall into two categories. There's, there's plotters, there's mm -hmm. pantsers, and then there's the in-between, the plotsers or whatever we call them. Yeah. But you're a really big proponent um, of outlining. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind, you know, talking about why that is, and then also how this book really is a utilization tool for people to take an idea that might really be overwhelming to them and break it down into simple, manageable steps. Yeah, that's the the overwhelming part is why I, I believe in outlining. And I, and I feel like people hear the word outline and they think it's like a Roman numeral indent, like little a, whatever, just like a really intricate, really intricate procedure. And I know somebody like Jeffrey Deaver is a famous outliner, right? I mean, 100, 100 plus pages of outlining. What I outline is uh, just the story skeleton. And so I do... I know what the inciting incident is, which is what sets the story in motion. I know what the climax is, which is when it all comes together. And I know the A story and the B story. So the general shape of the plot and the general shape of the, of the character arc. 
And then I just, I just have one sentence per scene. And a book has about 80 scenes. It doesn't take that long to do this. Um, and then when I start writing, then comes the fun stuff. It's like you're painting and you're coloring and you're making music and it's never wasted because I know it fits the story structure because I've already done that outline. So it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty low impact way to write. I mean, it's still hard. Writing a book is hard, uh, not digging a ditch hard, but it's hard. And so if I have that outline, it serves as a compass for the story so I can enjoy the process. Sure. And, and I love that. You know, I don't tend to write a lot of fiction. And I think one of the reasons is I can see sort of both sides of that argument. But I do find if I at least have a map, you yeah. know, either written down or in my head, it's easier to get from A to B to C versus just going in, not knowing, you know, what's going to happen. And sure, there's the element of surprise, but I think it's so easy, you know, to write yourself into a corner and then just give up because you have no idea what to do with it. And I think how many stories, how many books have never been finished just because, you know, somebody didn't have some idea of where they're going. And that doesn't mean that it, it won't change. It can change, right. but at least, you know, I think it's nice to have a vision, a destination, and then you have some idea. Maybe Absolutely. And my outlines always change. So there's always the element of surprise. But what I don't have is writer's block. Like if I, mm -hmm. if I wake up and, and something comes to me that's not in my outline, of course I put it in. But if nothing comes to me, I'm very blue collar. I'm like, this is the scene I'm writing today. And, and that's just, I make it, I make it my job. Sure. And I want to ask you about revision too, because you have such a refreshing you know, perspective on that and the opportunity, you know, that it gives you to make yourself a better writer, to make the book a better story. And I know that a lot of people, you know, they hear revision and they cringe and they kind of loathe that aspect of writing. So if you wouldn't mind sharing your perspective on that, I think it would be nice for people to hear. Yeah, I just saw a great quote a few days ago, uh, and I posted it to my, to my Facebook page, but it's essentially... I look, and this isn't from me, it's another author, she said, essentially I look at writing as shoveling sand into the sandbox so I can build castles later. And so that first draft, I love that so much. It's evocative and true. And so that first draft is just shoveling stuff in and then you get to play with it. Then you get to shape it and make it exactly um, what you want it to look like. And I, and I broke it down into, for me, it's very scene-based. Writing is very scene-based. And so I also edit by scenes. And so I have a, a revising method um, that makes sure your scene does what it's supposed to do. And it's, um, it's very manageable, I find. Sure. Uh, and I love too, you know, in your words, you said revision is literally, you know, to see something with new eyes. And it's like, Duh, how many of us think of it like that? It's so simple, but it's so profound. And again, I think it's one of those simple truths that we kind of can lose really, really easily. Like I read that and I wrote it down because I'm like, well, yeah, that's so obvious, but I never in my life, you know, thought about it like yeah. that. I read your chapter. Yeah, good. I'm glad that it hit. It did. Um, so, all right, let me ask you too. So, as a longtime instructor of creative writing, and you've talked a bit about this before, but can you tell me again, you know, what you found to be the most effective means of actually teaching craft to people? And then, if you wouldn't mind broadening that a bit, just to say, you know, a bit about some of the exercises that people will find in this book and how they can sort of use that to create their own convenient classroom at home as they sort of work on this book of theirs. Yeah, right. And so it's, as far as teaching, I still take workshops. I still read how-to books. Um, and I hopefully I always will because there's so much to learn. But I find for me that teaching that resonates the most is uh, teaching that is based on what I already know and builds off of that. And also teaching that is clear that it is a toolbox being offered to me rather than a, this is how you have to do it. Because I do not work well with you know, rigid, this is how you have to do it. And so in Rewrite Your Life, I share everything that I do. And I, with the understanding that it's not going to work for everybody, like not, that book is not going to work across the board for any one person, right? There'll be stuff they can take, stuff they leave behind, but I break it down into, you know, character, plot, setting, um, into a, a timeline that they can use to the, to their comfort level, to editing, and then what to do when you're finished with the book. But all of it is based on the idea that we have our stories, whether you want to write fiction or nonfiction, we have our stories and you can turn it into a book. If, if, if it's broken down, uh, it can be turned into a book. And so hopefully I'm never 
too prescriptive. Never your story has to do this. It cannot do this. It's more about trusting that the person knows what they want to do and I can share some tools. Sure. And I love too that in the book, not only do you share those tools and give writing prompts and exercises, um, but then you show us examples, you know, from your own work and you're really doing the exercises with us and you're applying them to your own novels, you know, so we can actually see this work in action. And, you know, at times you also call on other books that you've read and appreciated so we can apply it to that. So I think that, you know, people actually get to see how the process works for you and just the fact that it does you know work for you lends a little credence to the fact that it might work for us um, as well so I guess in that vein I'll start to wind down because I'm sure you have you know better things to do with your day than sit here with me um, <laughs> but people who tune in are always looking for words of encouragement or guidance and they've already gotten plenty but what I ask everybody is this uh, in terms of a writing life or a creative life more broadly what is the best advice that you were ever given, and then the best advice that you were never given and had to learn for yourself throughout the process of actually doing the work? Okay, this is a good question. I'm gonna answer it, but first, can I ask you the same question? Oh, man, man. <laughs> I'm like, you're the first person to turn this around on me, yes, Lori. <laughs> All right, so granted, I don't write novels, I don't write a ton of fiction, but I do, you know, author profiles and book reviews and stuff, and the simplest, you know, advice really I find is the advice that's probably the most important is just sit down in your chair and write something. It does not have to be beautiful, but words on the page can be fixed. And if there are no words on the page, then you have absolutely nothing to work with. So I'd say that's probably the best advice that I've ever been given. And again, you say, oh, well, that's so simple. And then you're like, yeah, but it doesn't get any more profound than that, because that's really how it starts and ends is you know, sitting in your chair and making words appear and then going back and fixing them later. Uh, and best advice that I was never given and had to learn for myself, I think I'm still working on that one. Yeah, yeah. I'm not qualified right? to answer that question, which is why I ask you. <laughs> I love your answer, right? It is it, it, the, the put your butt in the chair. It's simple, but it's, it's the truest thing out there. And I would expand on that a little bit, which is write, when you put your butt in the chair, write only for yourself. Because I see so many people um, have a great idea or even an okay idea that could become a great book, but they start to listen to uh, supposed imagined future criticism. Or if it's memoir, they start to worry about what happens when their uncle, mother, sister, brother reads it. Um, and so put your butt in the chair and then write that book just for yourself. You might never publish it, right? Or it might be a, a bestseller. It doesn't matter. You first have to write the draft. So for me, even now, however many books I am into it, I still have to write for myself first. And it's it gets harder because I can hear now my audience or my publisher or my agent, right? And I have to just shut them out. I, and I listen to them once I get that first draft done, but the first draft has to be just for me. The second part, the advice um, that I haven't gotten, but that I wish that I had, is that the second part? Yes. Yes. Or something that you've, you know, realized throughout the process that nobody ever told you, and you sort of came to that realization after having done, you know, all this great work. Yeah, right. All this great work. You know, I think it goes back to Rewrite Your Life, to my, to my thesis behind Rewrite Your Life, and that is that people want to hear your story. They want to hear what you have to say, uh, whether it's fiction or not fiction, nonfiction. If it's well written, people want to hear what you have to say. And so, I don't know. Like I hear people, they they're they're very tender about their ideas, as you should be, especially if it's memoir. I mean, only tell people you trust that you're thinking of writing a book, um, or don't tell anybody at all. You don't have to believe believe in yourself. And it sounds corny, but it, but I don't mean it like um, believe in yourself. I mean it quietly, tenderly, believe in what you're doing. Just do it. I think that's that's terrific advice. And I think so many people, you know, say, oh, who's going to care, you know, about my story? And you'd probably be surprised because so many people will relate in ways that you never even thought were possible. And again, if the story is not there, though, you're never going to Right, that. you're never gonna, you'll never know. And it doesn't even have, like you don't, you really don't have to publish it. Writing your story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction is transformative. There's science about it. There's an anecdotal experience about it. Cohering your thoughts into a story is a very transformative act. 
but all right, I've kept you here long enough, but I do I have to ask enjoyed you. this. This You're has been right. absolute fun. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's, I feel so lucky. I feel like I get to be the sponge and I just try to like absorb all these things. And I'm like, how lucky am I that I get to talk to cool people like you who've accomplished so much and who are very insightful, but also are a part of a very giving community. And that's something that really always heartens me about the mystery community is people are everybody's biggest supporters. Like it's, it's not a competition. It's such a generous community. I know but they, everybody says it and it's true. It's the most generous community. Maybe the other ones are too, but I think because we write about such dark stuff that we are, are interpersonally pretty light, pleasant people, or at least kind people. Of course, now that you've told us all about what you've written, I have to ask if you can leave us with a teaser of what we expect next. And Twitter tells me that, you know, you just submitted your next yeah. manuscript, which is a terrific achievement, but what are you at liberty to tell us to look forward to? My book, The Quarry Girls, comes out November 1st. It is the best thing I've ever written. And it is a fictionalized account of St. Cloud, Minnesota in 1977, uh, my hometown in 1977, when there were two and possibly three serial killers operating. And um, yeah, so I fictionalized that and told it from the point of view of uh, a teenage girl in that time period. And I hope everybody checks it out because I'm really proud of it. That sounds so good. Yeah, good. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I am sold on that. And in the meantime, you know, so many books to pick up. And I have to say, um, I love to, you don't just write one thing. You sort of write what moves you. And, you know, you've written yeah. magical realism and young adult and obviously, you know, crafty books and darker thrillers, comedic capers. And again, that's sort of proof that you can write the story that moves you and you don't have to be totally pigeonholed. So exactly. if people are looking for the proof of that, Jess Lowry is the proof of that. But if you're waiting for Corey Girls, you got lots of good reading to do. Bloodline, Rewrite Your Life, and a stack of other terrific books. Thank you so much for sharing so generously with us. It was my pleasure, John. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.